Okay, Adam. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. I'm so excited to have you here. There's a universal question around the table, and I'm going to go through your bio and all that other stuff just to be clear. Okay. But, but I have to say, there is none of us are from Silicon Valley in a traditional way that you are. I try to fake like I am, but I'm not. I'm from Canada and it shows Kevin's from Canada. He tried to emigrate. Is it working? Did I did. It, I listen really. I know, but are you really from Silicon Valley now? No, I'm I definitely not. Joe was no. in Los Angeles, but he built clout in San Francisco, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And then Andy, who saw on our podcast, is from New York, Lehman Brothers, to give you a sense. And so what is it like to be like from Silicon Valley, like deep tech? How are things different? Give us the inside view. Oh, I'm happy to, although it's a little bit of a embarrassing topic. I've always thought that what makes Silicon Valley great are all the people who come to Silicon Valley. So I'm always a little sheepish about admitting that I was born in Stanford Hospital and my wow. family moved around one place to another, never settling down, Menlo Park, Mountain View, I, Los I, I, Altos. It's crazy. Nice. Yeah. So <laughs> it's very varied, but I know it. I hope you do appreciate though, that for the Canadians, Canadians are a big part of, of Silicon Valley. And so we always like to throw a few weeks every year that are just almost to freezing just to make you feel the love. And we're doing it right now because it is cold. Anyway, no, it's funny. Um, I probably took it for granted growing mm -hmm. up. My parents are both doctors. Dad's an OBGYN. Mother's a psychologist still practicing. And so I didn't feel immersed in tech. There were probably little clues along the yeah. way that I missed. Maybe my elementary school had Apple IIs early because there actually were people who worked at Apple who, who right. were connected yeah. to the school. Mm -hmm. And there were probably some names of parents in my high school that if I knew anything, I'd be like, oh, Adobe, that's a big company. That name is yeah. familiar as a founder, et cetera. But, mm -hmm. but the truth is, I don't think I really got immersed into tech, ironically, until I went to Stanford for my undergrad and got connected in. But the big thing that I internalized growing up here in the Valley was I just tend to learn from people. Okay. And so it was very visible, right? Whose parents were at the baseball games in the afternoon? Where did people mm -hmm. live? What kind of life did they seem stressed? Were they away on business all the time? And probably one of the things I did pick up was that at least at the time growing up was as I pieced together, like whose family worked in technology and that sort of thing. I just noted that they had a lot of flexibility. Like they yeah. were living their life Ooh. largely as they wanted to live it. And maybe things have changed, but growing up, it was like a lot of the things are the same. My kids play at the same baseball fields and soccer sure. fields that I played at. And a lot of the restaurants have turned over, but some of the old good right. ones are still around. But it is it is funny to watch the Valley kind of grow around you. It really sure. felt smaller in many ways and less professional, less yeah. and certainly <laughs> less money back in the 80s when I was a kid. There was, a, there was like a brief period of time in between companies. I don't know if this is, you were at Greylock, you were an EIR at Greylock, is that right? Yes. I liked yeah. it so much. I did it twice. So we know you by reputation in some cases. In fact, I expanded your history in my mind. You grew up in Silicon Valley, like we said, doing a master's in computer science at Stanford. You have a history with Apple. Everyone in the Valley worked at eBay at some point. One of them. <laughs> then you ended up directing product at LinkedIn. You were CEO at Wealthfront, which we're super curious about and we want to dig into a little bit. You were an EIR at Greylock, as you said, and then and Dropbox. Obviously. And now you start Daffy and you raised, I think a, now the answer is, is 17 million or so bucks to run it. And we want to ask you about that because this is principally abounding. How did I do, Kevin? Did I do okay? I think you did great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Did we miss anything? You missed one little thing I'm fond of and one thing I am I tend to not highlight so much, but it's all good. I've had a bit of a journeyman's career throughout Silicon Valley. Although I, I laughed at the eBay story, of course, because it's, it feels like that sometimes. Definitely feels like that. That's what I feel like. Every It's interesting. For either of my last company, we ended up hiring as CEO after I was CEO. And we got, I got to say, it's, we're a bunch of founders. You're a founder of companies also. And I want to understand what it is like for the CEO after the founder. Got to know. What is that experience like? Oh, wait. Are, we're talking eBay. We're talking Wealthfront. Wealthfront. What are we talking? Wealthfront. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. jumping around a little bit. Yeah, we are. I thought we were going to tell old war stories about the bubble bursting and the we'll get there. Web yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, I think that going, there's different philosophies of CEOs coming into 
to companies. I think there is not one rule for it or standard. It depends on the company and the phase it's in. It's very different coming in to companies like being the first CEO after a founder for a public company that's large and established is different than a startup. Right. Not to overplay the eBay thing. There's a big difference between Meg Whitman coming into eBay when it's 30 people. Yep. Free IPO and that sort of thing versus Jeff Wiener came into LinkedIn when it was about 300 and something people, right? Mm -hmm. They've been order of magnitude bigger, but still well before the IPO, et, et cetera. Versus what you, when you, a CEO takes over a public company that's been around for 10 to 15 years under the founder. Yeah. But for Wealthfront, actually, Wealthfront story is a very simple one. I actually knew some people who were very early at Wealthfront when it was ka -ching. There were a couple yeah. ex-LinkedIn folks who had gone over. But I really, so I had familiar with it, and I'd actually been an early customer when they pivoted to Wealthfront. I was one of the first people who opened an account. I think it was a few weeks after the pivot. But I actually met Wealthfront largely, it was very thesis-driven. I was at Greylock in 2012 after LinkedIn mm. as the IR, but I was poking around looking what smart people were doing. I ran into all these people who were founding great companies around financial applications. I bet right. Bo from Future Advisor, Ken at Credit Karma, Brian with Coinbase. Actually, it's very funny. Some of my original bonding with Mickey Malka at Ribbit Capital was because he actually did all the deals that I wanted to do, but couldn't get <laughs> through in 2012. Oh, man. Credit Karma and Coinbase and, and all these ones. But Really, I was excited because my whole career has been a bit about what can technology do next? What vertical area can it go into? And so for me, I'm always looking for that next move. And so I had always loved personal finance. And my senior project in college was a better Quicket. That's always been my thing. And so the idea, but I also knew it was a very tortured area to go into. We hadn't figured out as an industry how to build great businesses in that space. You had one-offs, right? Obviously, Intuit, amazing great planes, you had a few right. of these, but it was too few to really build a venture practice on. And so I was excited about it. And I think that the, I think the Greylock folks were happy to have me chase these things down. They're like, look, Adam, he, he has an MBA. He likes coins. Let him go look at the money stuff. But I got conviction in about 2012 that actually something had changed, that we were going to be able to build large venture class businesses in, in finance and in finance publications. FinTech wasn't a word then. And then I met Andy and we talked about Wealthfront and we talked about, and I remember this conversation, he came down to Greylock, we were chatting. I told him I love the product, thought it was great, recommended it. But I was like, I, I don't know if it can work. And he was like, what's the problem? Is it the business model? Is it, I said, no, actually I love the business model. I think AUM for this business is actually mm. a very clever way yeah. to borrow some scalability and actually make the economics scale with the business. But I was worried about growth. I was worried about distribution. Right. That's always the hardest thing for consumer businesses. I was like, look, there were two things we learned in Web2 how to do. One was user-generated content. The other was virality and actually self-distribution. And I just wasn't sure. And he said, we've rolled out imitations at Wealthfront. They, they're better than I expected. And he said, actually, if someone receives a Wealthfront imitation right now, there's about a one in eight chance that they're going to open up an account. Wow. And by the way, that number is not a great number. Right compared to viral social networks, et cetera. But remember, I had come from LinkedIn, which was not the most viral and <laughs> engaging of social networks. And I built the growth team there back in the day when we'd had growth issues. And so I looked at the number and said, that's not a good enough number, but it's within spitting distance. Like we could huh. make that work. Do you and think I just got excited about trying. And so I signed up. And mm -hmm. so I think when you sign up as a CEO with founders, you either have to go all the way to see yourself as a co-founder, even though you're not, but you have to almost act as if with that moral authority. But at minimum, you have to act as a partner with the founders. And the nice thing sure. about being an adventure firm, et cetera, good, bad, and ugly, is you learn how partnerships work and don't work. And right. took the leap and obviously spent a lot of formative years trying to get that crazy idea of having people have their money managed by a computer <laughs> off the ground. But uh, it's exciting to see the scale that it's yeah, gotten. Yeah, I'm curious, why did, you why did you think that it would be a hard thing to grow? Is that just because of the incumbent financial players that you had in there, obviously like Fidelity and those types of things? Because now it seems quite obvious to have a mobile like investment application. There's lots. I know you're involved in Acorns as well. Why, why was that? Yeah, Wealthfront was actually a little bit pre-mobile, to be honest, right? We, I remember actually tortured meetings at Wealthfront trying to justify from the metrics basis, like doing a native application, et cetera. At right. some point, it was just like, we're going to go to where, we're going to skate to where the puck's going to be. We're going to, we're just going to be there and do this. But no, it wasn't about the incumbents. I actually think very little about them knowing I, I'm a big fan of Clay Christensen. He was my advisor mm -hmm. in school. He's passed away now. That's but he was amazing. 
he was such a wonderful thinker and uh, really a great man in, in many ways. But I wasn't worried about the incumbents because I knew who their best customers were. And they were not the customers we were going after. And I knew that effort they spent going after our customers was going to detract them from a very competitive fight between the incumbents. If you're Fidelity and right. Schwab, the truth is worrying about Wealthfront is a mistake. You're worried about Vanguard. And you should have right. been worried about Vanguard. And you didn't spend enough time on Vanguard. You're still not spending enough time on Vanguard. But, but no, I was actually more worried because it's just the scars from history. And sometimes those mm -hmm. are good scars and they help you learn. Sometimes they're baggage. But the big lesson from Web 1.0 for me, there were a couple of things that didn't scale in Web 1.0. And that's why when the bubble burst and the water went out, a lot mm -hmm. of businesses went away. One was the idea if your acquisition method was basically paying for acquisition, either through expensive brand building mm -hmm. or through paid advertising, that was just a very fragile place to be. It's a super competitive market. The economics are not always rational. Mm -hmm. The cash flow out, you can dig a hole that you won't be able to dig out of later right. on. The mm -hmm. second thing, of course, was content creation didn't scale. You can hire an editor, two editors, 10 editors, 100. At some point, that gets impossible to really manage economically. And so Web 2.0 a lot was about the industry, in my view, figuring out different ways to solve that problem. And so on acquisition, we figured out, oh, wait, what we now call product-led growth. But at the time, yeah. the basic, but this idea of what mm -hmm. actually scaled and worked is that if each of your customers effectively becomes an evangelist and salesperson mm -hmm. for your product, mm -hmm. that does scale, right? Yeah. That almost scales right. infinitely. And, and there were other methods, by the way, that I would count half a dozen. I used to do these growth talks. But, but so when I looked at FinTech, that was one of the things that had held it back historically was that the business model was still very much locked. Actually, almost in the desktop era, we were still at 2012. You were still paying for TurboTax and Quicken products like that, like every year with some upgrade. Like they did, couldn't quite get to a subscription. It was just more like every year you buy the new version. It's like, they were, it was almost like Madden like on in video games, like, can you get them to buy the new one every year? Maybe. But that's why I was worried about it at the time. Yeah. Now, in retrospect, I think I underestimated the poll, obviously, with mobile. I think that we got better at brand building. And also, we entered a market, which we'll see again. It may be dormant for a little while. Yeah. This positive tech bias of people who are trying new technology because they assume that there were better things on the horizon, that consumer bias that there had to be a better way to do things, a new way to do things. Hopefully we'll see it again. I'm counting on it for the most part, but it, was, it turned out to be a great time to build new products and services. Sounds like an app sort of future positive as a, a positive, an optimism around the future that like maybe isn't present in the same way anymore. Oh, the future will save us. And it's like maybe the thought that's not the case anymore or something. No, I, it comes and goes as different arguments about this. I actually happen to be very old fashioned about this. Maybe it's the gray hairs coming in, but I started, you start seeing patterns and, and like demographics matter. When I was at Wealthfront, I didn't have this thesis going in, but when I looked at, I remember I went through every customer at Wealthfront when I joined. It was less than 1500 when I joined, Press. less than 1500 customers. <laughs> and most of those had been borrowed over from ka -ching, So they really authentically weren't Wealthfront mm -hmm. customers. But I remember going through it and going, Andy and, and Dan were very advocates, like the engineers love this. And it was true, like 10 to 15% of the clients were engineers. That's mm -hmm. unusual, but not so unusual for a new business in Silicon Valley, a new consumer product. But what I'm surprised is actually, what really hit me was that most of the customers were what you'd normally call kind of young professionals. They were late twenties to late thirties, but they were doctors and lawyers and associate professors and consultants. Basically, if you were like in your late twenties, early thirties and doing fairly well in your career, like overall, right. and there were a lot of founders, designers, but it looked like that customer base. And I said, it really clicked for me that how much is driven by demographics, right? When you look at, I know that these companies are older, but Schwab and Vanguard really started, Schwab started in the 70s. Vanguard launched their first index fund in the mid 70s. If you look at how old the baby boomers were at the time, you're like, oh, I get it. They were hitting their 30s and starting yeah. to have some money and, and they didn't want their parents. They were doing things a different way. They were willing to place a trade over the phone. And I think that I hate to sound simplistic about it, but I think that part of what drove the last decade was just for lack of a better term, a lot of millennials just hitting that age, hitting that starting to hit the adulting phase of having mm -hmm. jobs, having careers, having money, thinking about settling right. down, having families. And so things like Robin Hood, Coinbase taking off, acorns, yeah. like mm -hmm. that's a following that trend. Far on the internet.
You yeah. know what I mean? It's this is a little bit of the Clay Christensen thing once again, which is that you assume the existing businesses know their best customers. The right. average customer at these businesses are in their 50s and they have several hundred grand. They're at a different point. And Vanguard uh, told me once explicitly that they really focused on people who are plus or minus 10 years from retirement. <laughs> and that's because you go where the, there's that old joke, right? Yep. Was it Billy the Kid or whatever the old Western analogy was like? Why do you rob banks it's where they keep the money? That sort of thing. It's, I think the incumbents go after older customers because it's just life. People accumulate money sure. over time. So yeah. older people have more money. But to me, what was exciting about the last decade in FinTech was you just had this artificial boom of people who are not the best customer. You walk into, if you're 32, yeah. you walk into a big bank or brokerage, like you can feel it. Like they're nice to you enough, but. You're not their core customer. It's not their like focus. It's classic it's Clay yeah. Christensen, really. Yeah. Let's take the discarded customers that nobody cares about and let's make a business around them and grow that. And like I said, like to be fair to Clay, it's, it's not totally discarded. It's just like, you're not the focus, right? Fidelity yes. has a hundred services. Like if you are older and you have a life and all sorts of complicated things, they have every type of account. They have advisors on the account. They have all this stuff. If you're just getting started, that you're not really the focus. And, and so that combination with, I think, a generation that fundamentally, I used to, I never found a great word for this, so I apologize, but I used to call it in board meetings. I'd talk at like technophilic customers. There's people whose hmm. assumption is that the sure. new tech is bad until it gets, and there are people who like have this bias towards technology. I want to try the new thing. And so you just had a huge number of people every year who were in this thing of, I don't love this. I'm willing to try something new. And by the way, I have a bias towards the new thing because I know the old thing right. for my parents. Yeah. So at least I have a shot with the new thing for it being for me. So I don't want to go play them. golf with somebody to give away my money. Oh yeah. I used to actually feel really bad. A lot of financial advisors in Silicon Valley going through the early IPO booms, et cetera, you'd always see them. I always felt bad for the financial advisor to go talk to a Google engineer. Like they're building their practice, but <laughs> that's a rough meeting. Google engineers look at them like, how well did you do on your boards? And like, where did you go to school? And do you really know math? And why are you talking to me? Who's managing the people's money? Do you spend all your time mm -hmm. having coffees? And it's just totally it, advisors have a rough road building that business. And uh, yeah. it's even harder, I think, in the tech crowd. But Wealthfront, to me, Wealthfront was the perfect product for that market because you have a group that assumes that technology can be better than humans in some ways. It made sense to them. The computer is going to watch my money 24-7. If there's a tax loss harvesting opportunity, it's the computer that's going to spot it, not someone checking my account once a quarter. It, just, it wasn't just Wealthfront. I think it was a wonderful time to build out these services. And the great thing about mm -hmm. the industry, once you prove that it's possible, it's a little bit like the four-minute mile. Like all Everyone of a sudden can you do get, it. Right. Yeah, it's like everyone right. knows you can build these businesses. And so it's been just exciting to see for me since, like I said, I have this bias towards technology. I'm a technology optimist in the end. And so for me, having technology roll through all these sectors, it's the opportunity to meaningfully make these things much more abundant, much lower cost, much higher mm -hmm. quality for a much broader audience of people than before. And so I'm just really happy that personal finance hit that stride. Um, there's right. a lot more work to do. I think there's a lot more work to do in fintech, but uh, I just get, I get excited every time technology moves into a new sector. Yeah. I'm like, curious. I'm curious what made you make, so obviously you spent a lot of time in, in fin, fintech and so being part of Wealthfront, you have, you're, you're still on the board of Acorns as well, which right. is a, which a, is a, I guess the audience probably, is that millennials? I'm assuming it's for funny. I think the generational stuff too. at this point, and I don't want to say it was just the pandemic, et cetera, but it has been 10 years. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think the curve is, I think with new financial brands, et cetera, uh, I think we've crossed over at chasm now. Right. Into both the early and in some cases, you starting to see some late majority folks coming in that, that willingness to trust your money online. Totally. Uh, but, but no, Acorns is, I think at this point, Acorns is very broad based. Acorns really is almost now a psychographic. It's more for people who want to like, just have a healthier financial life, right? It tends to be not oriented towards a lot where a lot of fintechs focus on people who've already made it, who have money coming in, trying to figure out their financial goals. Acorn starts even earlier with people just getting started with basic saving. Right. And then Acorns has everything now, right? Like you can save, of course. you can have accounts for your kids, you can have investment accounts, you can have emergency funds. It's really actually a wonderful platform. And I don't know, I Acorns has been wonderful for me to watch because watching just a simple mobile app 
that help people save their spare change now have almost 5 million customers paying That's amazing. to help them with their financial lives. Frankly, I don't know that I would have had the confidence to do Daffy if I had yeah, seen Acorn question. How, scale. How, how did that, that you being into FinTech for so long and then getting a sure and I love an explanation of what Daffy is as well. Like, and what actually got you to start and found Daffy? This is also your first time founding a company from nothing as well, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've already, I was actually very sheepish being on the show because it's this is the first time I've been a founder. I've been very early at a couple startups and <laughs> yeah. been been the We're first here to school you, some, but exactly no. of course. Yeah. Teach us some of your angel investing, though. <laughs> Teach us some of those. Seriously, it's, it is the next Figma coming through your door, and can you share it with this podcast? Can you call it's, us? Yes, yeah, it is. It's called Airhouse, and he invested in it. We all know the lesson. <laughs> I've already written about the Figma thing, but I think everyone now knows the lesson from Figma is just be nice to your in turns man like just totally like, just like dylan was and by the way dylan dylan field gets the credit for me of course joke around about this but he was in fact the first intern ever at any tech company that made me feel old i think we were talking about star wars or something like that late one night and i was referencing the prequels etc and he was just like of course i didn't see those in the theater because I didn't even know when he was born. I think it was technically in the 90s. But I was just like, oh my God. But but no, I actually like the lesson with Figma. To me that you asked a little bit earlier about growing up in Silicon Valley and how yeah. that affects you. The thing is when you grow up in the Valley, you just realize how much it's about people. Real people, real lives. Companies come and go. Sectors come and go. There's booms right. and busts. There's competition, et cetera. But they're just people. They, they live lives. They're dating. They have jobs. They have kids, et cetera. And all these products and services fit into in the companies you build, but it's just a part of life type of mm. thing. I learned this early in my career, but like in LinkedIn, it is a good lesson. I was a VP at LinkedIn mm -hmm. or product, et cetera. Dylan was in my group. There was no reason he would even know me. We were big enough that he didn't necessarily know me, but I loved hanging out. I love brainstorming. I love the energy and excitement. And for me, the intern program is part of how not only a company brings in new talent, but also refreshes its own thinking about what would you sure. see with a clean site and that sort of thing. Yep. And you just never know. That's the crazy thing about Silicon Valley. Like he wasn't like a Teal fellow at the time. He wasn't he's a, he's like a sophomore at Brown. I, he wasn't obviously, but the fact that the fact that he liked talking to me enough that when he did decide to start a company, he came to me for a little advice and knew I was involved. And the fact that I talked to him and got excited. And, and by the way, his, the original idea that he had was not what stigma is. He was just actually excited first principles that, hey, I think there's a fundamental problem. People assume yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. that graphic design has to be done local because you need this big beefy machine. But the truth is it's backwards. Big beefy knee fits the cloud better. It paralyzes well. That, we is, now have enough that is a secret. The way Peter Thiel, you know how Peter Thiel talks about yeah. looking for secrets. That is one of them, the way you're expressing it now. It, it did, you've seen a lot of eventually super successful entrepreneurs pass through your door one way or another. Are they, are they different? I, we're not, I, mean, I don't consider myself great or at least not prove now great. And I think that everyone else here feels like they have something to prove for the ones where the outcomes have happened. Is there something that you see that is easily recognizable having seen enough? I think I, the short answer is no, I'd be better at it if, if I did. <laughs> Thank you so much. I and my head, right? and honestly, like you have to remember at this point, the angel I've invested in over a hundred companies and 125 yeah, yeah. maybe after I haven't tallied up 2022 yet, but, and it's a little too early. Like I have a good read on how good an angel investor I was between 2012 and 2014, but we'll see there. But I will tell you, there's a couple of things that for me are reliable patterns. And when I look at the folks that have succeeded. There are a couple of trends and Kevin, maybe this answers your question a bit about Angel. So one is that pattern we talked about with Dylan that I have seen is there is something about clarity of thinking around, I don't want to call it first principle, but just a clarity of thinking of a very simple hypothesis, right? Even LinkedIn, but part of the reason I loved Reed the first time I met him, wanted to work with him, learn with him. We've been good friends now for a long time and work together on different projects is he just has a clarity of thinking sometime about not just technology, the way like markets evolve, businesses evolve, like what the timing is. And so that a little bit of that clarity, like I said, with Dylan, that basic flip, you said the secret, like Peter Thiel, but like that basic idea of, I had done a lot of graphics work in grad school. Like I had done enough graphics programming to know, yes, it does parallelize well. I also had done enough graphics work to really have this weird bias that said, yeah, the last thing that's going to fold to the cloud, maybe never is going to be right. graphics. And by the way, video games almost sent me the wrong direction because video games 
really resisted the cloud for a long time. Sure. Like, no, I'm going to juice every bit of performance out of this local thing. And so when Dylan said that to me saying, actually, I think people are wrong. Bandwidth has gotten high enough now that actually you can pipe the bits over for the interface and having an infinitely scalable cluster in the cloud. And that's actually what you want. I was like, wait, I had interned at NASA early parallelization. Hmm. I was like, no, that's exactly right about the back end parallelization. What we did with fluid dynamics thousand years ago, when we were trying to replace wind tunnels. And then I was like, yeah, even at LinkedIn, LinkedIn had this terrible thing. You had to use Outlook. I don't want to talk about it. It was just one of those things that companies did back then. And uh, <laughs> Outlook was just miserable on the Mac and Outlook for the web did not work at the time. And so I would actually basically SSH in, I would basically, I had a, I'd done very insecure, by the way, I'd poked a hole through for my personal cert, like my computer at work, a PC that I basically used for Outlook. That's all mm. it was. Oh, that's funny. But I was like, the bits flow were just fine. Like connect over any connection. Like I'd be at Starbucks, use my, et cetera. And so when he just said it, I just went through, I don't even know anymore why I believe that wasn't true. Like a game changing moment. So I, I think there are founders that have those things and I look for those and that's happened in FinTech, et cetera, around like different ideas, like a little bit. And by the way, sometimes even deals I didn't do. Like when I met with Vlad and Baiju, I just started at Wealthfront oh, wow. and mm -hmm. I met with them right around the corner, right there to talk about it. And by the way, I definitely should have done that seed. And I was yeah, worried at the time about Robin the for everybody. I, yeah, I was worried about the optics if the CEO, the new CEO of Wealthfront, I'd never been a CEO totally. before. That the makes CEO sense. of Wealthfront had put yeah. money into Robinhood. What did that mean? Although, ironically, Index was fine with it. And of course, they, they did both sides. Go figure. But, <laughs> yeah, go figure. Yeah, they've been in the business longer than I had. But I remember meeting with them and talking, and they've been so many free trading sites. But like the basic thing was like they basically said, hey, we post this stuff on Reddit in the community. It's like just booming. And so we actually think like we have a few hundred thousand people. We actually think we're going to get most of those people to sign up for accounts. So we think we just go from the get go, get a huge volume. And they had different ideas how they'd make money over time. And I remember thinking at that same time that I had such a strong bias that a free trading site could never work, that maybe right. I couldn't see it clearly. Mm -hmm. Maybe communities like Reddit had gotten big enough that they could actually get that initial critical mass going. I, I didn't have conviction about it. I probably would have it's far harder to do it. And obviously it was a mistake not to do it. But I do think that some of those, like for me, those moments, especially if someone's been around long enough, being willing to go, I'm so sure of this thing. Am I really right? Or was that true like yeah. 10 years ago and something has, right. and that's the second thing I always love looking for is what changed? Is there what, a market like, now geez, where it classic, wasn't? Uh, why now? Right slide or whatever. And, and by the way, this is like some of my feeling about where actually, I think this FinTech game of the last decade of going after young users, I think that's going to become an anachronism now. I remember the first time mm -hmm. I went to the movies with my parents and I was so used to getting them tickets and they showed up. They're like, oh no, hold up the iPhone. They had figured out Fandango, right? And that sort of thing. But my parents are now in their seventies. I was like, okay, if my parents have figured out how to yeah. buy tickets online, like that ticket booth is now not a thing. That's, I don't know where the last late adopters are going to be, but that's pretty far. But and the pandemic, same example, my parents loved bringing their checks in from their business to the bank once a week, First Republic, a drop mm -hmm. of very old fashioned, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And guess what the pandemic did? They're all using bill pay. They're all using remote deposit, et cetera. And so I, I think that one of the exciting things that's going to happen in the next 10 years, as soon as we get clear of some of this turbulence, economic turbulence we're going through, the market just got a lot bigger. There's yeah. a lot more people out there who have actually discovered that actually technology is not all bad. It's actually super know, convenient it's, to get stuff done. It, it does make me wonder, because for example, a number of us here have, in 2008, we're not best entrepreneurs or CEOs. Joe was. And, oh, and I was wondering if it produces unique scar tissue that y'all have from 2008, that we're all going to have from 2000, whatever the year this is happening. Is there like a unique, is there like a footprint that that economic uncertainty like slams in your face that you're never able to get off or whatever? Joe, uh, you go first. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Joe, please do. Hey, please. Yeah, I graduated college in 2000, so came right in. I had six months of work before I got laid off from my first job as an engineer and then started Clout in 2008, was building when Lehman Brothers collapsed and had quit my job and thought I'd raise money and it would all be okay. And then was like, oh, wow, there's that's not happening. And I think it has rippled through my career and always made me skeptical that things weren't as good as they appeared. And I think that mm. has served me well, but always made me sound like just off from 
people younger on the team that I'd be like, no, guys, this could flip at any moment. And they're, they're like, no, no, everything's fine. It's always been yeah. fine. If you mm -hmm. haven't seen it and been through it, it's easy to not feel that pain. So I do think we will all going forward and the generation coming up behind all of us will have that burnt into their psyche. And it'll be interesting to see the ripple from that. You've mm -hmm. been through this too. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I do think it varies and it does. The damage varies between people who get so burnt out, they become cynical, they bail. Right. And, I know people you know, like that. Yeah. But I'll tell you, once again, I don't want to, maybe it's because I did grow up here, et cetera. I was more attentive, but even just going back to like Stanford, like when I was in school, so I started school in the early nineties. Right. And so that was already a recession. That was already like good times right. are right. over tech company layoffs, HP, like all this stuff. And so I remember just as an undergrad, I literally had people telling me like, this is why you major in electrical engineering, not computer science, because electrical engineering is a real engineering degree. And <laughs> like, I'm not kidding that at Stanford, yep. they would point to and say electrical engineers make so much more money than software engineers. This is why <laughs> not kidding. I think it was a few thousand dollars. It was a real thing, but, and then you watch the boom form and then bus 95, the newspapers were filled in the Valley with Sil Silicon graphics was going to hire three to 5,000 engineers in the next 12 months. Pixar had just launched Toy Story 3D was huge. So watching the bubble, and then of course the web happened, the bubble burst. So I feel like now I've been there like at least three or four times. I think there's a lot of important lessons. I think most people who go through it, it is what Joe said. It's a little bit of this, well, I don't call it scarring. It's more of that pragmatism and realizing that there are cycles. And by the way, they're not all about right. tech. We, we tend to talk about tech as like all tech, like the world's a big place. The economy is a big place, but these booms and busts, I think the idea that like, Knowing when things are good, you know, having that feeling like, hey, this is really good. It doesn't last forever. And look, I'm a, yeah. when times are bad, just knowing that this too shall pass. And actually, it, I always right. use the analogy a little bit of the forest fire. Like you asked me about the eBay joke you made that everyone worked at eBay. <laughs> because after the forest fire, there were very few Web 1.0 companies that made it through. Google was almost too new True. and they almost artificially made it through. eBay, although they found PayPal. early money. eBay, PayPal was a weird anomaly, but yeah eBay, right, right. Yeah, yeah, Yahoo, yeah. like 1.5. Amazon barely squeaked through, man. That, right, that yeah, convertible right. debt they were in the whole thing. But what happened was all the good people who are around, who are like, I want, who like growth. I remember going, when my venture capital firm folded their Silicon Valley office, I was looking around and I was like, I just want to go somewhere that's growing. I only could come up with half a dozen companies at the time that were growing like 50 to 100% year over year. It was like eBay. Wow. There was Yahoo, VMware, PayPal, Google. There, there were a few, but it was not a long list. But yeah. the reason so many good people went there is that it, like a forest fire, like most of it mm -hmm. didn't work. Content, and by the way, the ecosystem's now open. You have a lot of freedom to grow and expand if you can succeed. So I don't know, but it definitely affects things. And it, I think it makes things look a little bit brighter when things are dark and makes things look a little darker and brighter. It's no secret here with Daffy, you mentioned fundraising. I raised the seed in the end of 2020, and we can talk about the founding story there. But one of the reasons I raised the A earlier than I planned yeah. was, first of all, I could. So that was, turns out to be your back. 2020 right? hindsight <laughs> it turned out I, I got through, I did it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure your, back because, your background helped as well. That helps. I think that you do. Background does help and it gives you more trust and faith. But I always think for founders, a little bit of matching the current psychology of the market. And yeah. we, had a, we had an avenue to do that because to be honest, my background can work against you in venture circles, right? It's, hey, I'm totally. very successful. Does he really want to do a company? Is he going to work hard? Yeah, is he yeah. really going to yep. build a team? Or is it? He's also know, so doing all these angel investment and investing. He's on the yeah. board. Like he's doing all the things. He's got the things. kids yeah. break in Hawaii. Oh, ski week, yeah. you mean? <laughs> ski week, thank you. Oh, yeah. anyway, I, it's ski week in Hawaii. Oh, I see. What you're and it's not, <laughs> that, that, that didn't quite compute in my hand for a second. I was like, you're not ski in Hawaii that well. But, but no, but one of the reasons I raised, I was originally planning to raise in late 2022. That was our original plan. Sure. But the reason I raised earlier is because just things felt so, so high and so good. I was like, I don't know how long this is, could last. It could last yeah. a year or two or so, but I've been wrong about these things before. Like, Founding so startups it, in San actually, Francisco. It really does prove out. Like I was talking yeah. to Sam Porcos on another podcast last week. Yeah. yeah. The guy who started Levels. And he was like, oh yeah, he's on based financing. I was stuck in this mode for so long of when you in, when you have six months of runway, you finance the business. For so long, I did this trying to get as far as I could. When I realized, oh, this actually has, has nothing to do with how effective. It's all about the milestones and how you can sell. Talk, talk through that, essentially.
Yeah, and this is where the macro stuff comes in and it matters. I actually, I fundamentally believe that building companies is mostly just about building the company, like all the pieces you have to do, team, building the product, strategy, execution, go to market, all those different things. But it also, there's a cyclical nature to the business. There are times when capital is less expensive and more expensive. And there's certain types of businesses that take longer to build that are prohibitive when capital is expensive. There are, there are businesses that are actually wonderful businesses, but really only suit where cost of capital is lower. And getting back to the Daffy story of trying to build a large platform oriented around giving at scale makes perfect sense, but it's also not going to take off the way rate my, who do I like? And my dating apps and I would have, I'm like, you're not going to hit that. I wish it was that exciting, but it turns mm -hmm. out like even LinkedIn in a funny way, I, I, maybe I pattern match a little bit off this, like LinkedIn, remember LinkedIn founded in late 2002, launched May, 2003. Why? Because PayPal was one of the few positive outcomes in that era, but a crazy group of people, including Reed, who were like, yep. not only I still want to do, there's still more to do. And. I'm actually willing to put my own money to work and my own time trying to make these things happen. But it was a slow build, man. LinkedIn like, launched in 2003, May, May 5th. Reed went through his address book of all the people to invite. And by the way, Reed's address book better than sure. better over time, but <laughs> even them. <laughs> but you're talking thousands. <laughs> you're not talking millions. I think LinkedIn took a year and a half to get to even a million. You social right. network is tortured. But uh, you even see yeah. now what we have chat GPT, what they get to a million users in five days or something like that. Yeah. It's that's not you know, nice GPT, by the way, there's some magic <laughs> there. I will tell you going back. I'm sorry. You guys are going to think that all of my logic about looking at tech markets is stories about my parents. No, I think it's super, but, it, um, it, it's a unique, can I tell you that perspective, both of my parents, my mother and my father had not only asked me how to get to chat GPT multiple wow. times, but wow. I had to get to the point where I actually saved it to their home screen. So it looks like an app so they can click on it. That is, how not, normal. Now? That is not normal consumer yeah. behavior. Huh? How old are they, are they now? Oh, they're in their seventies. Okay. Their 70s. Amazing. Uh, my dad's that retired. My, my mother's still practicing for sure. And, but no, it's just, it's, and I have these conversations. My mom, of course, being a psychologist is fascinated just what it all means and what the computer can do and what it can't do. And why does it appear yeah. certain ways? And. I had a conversation with her yesterday over lunch very much about, sorry, I, I see my parents once a week because I'm a big believer in frequency. That's the a great are idea. Important to That's you, great. You move mm -hmm. from annual to quarterly, quarterly to monthly, right. monthly to <laughs> weekly. <laughs> Seriously, I, mm -hmm. I, like everyone, I read that Medium post about by the time you're 18, you've seen your parents 93% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's too high. And so that's why everyone clicks and reads the article. But, right. but the truth is, I think there's a lot of truth that I actually have done that a lot in my life, but we were talking yesterday and it was just that idea of like, it seems like we've done a really good job. We always knew that computers, we nailed memory a while ago. We've done right. very good computers have an inhuman capacity in both scale and speed for memory. Layering communication over it is a big deal. It's a big piece sure. of what makes chat PD yeah. different than like a query engine is that. It seems to have nailed a way of communicating with humans that feels good and feels differentiated yeah. from just getting an encyclopedia entry or you know, an article. It also doesn't someone. have like actually the uncanny valley visually happens, but the uncanny valley does not happen in written form. So it feels human in a much simpler way. I think. Yeah. I, so uh, the problem is humans is that we, we are used to interpreting communication from other humans as an indicator of intelligence indicator of knowledge, indicator of logic and capacity for kind of thought. Like we, it may not be a good proxy, by the way, and there's all sorts of bias that creeps in around it. But fundamentally, when we hear people talk to us about different ideas, influences how smart we think they are, what we think they know, who that person is. Man, I love the Uncanny Valley. That, that's a, a longstanding concept that I've used for guides around AI and, and that sort of thing. But it's, yeah, it's clearly chat GPT has crossed over where I actually argued five or six years ago, one of the startups I was on the board of a company called Pullstring. I wrote this whole piece about how I thought that we were too focused on the Turing test mm -hmm. and not focused enough on what drama folks have known forever in the arts, which is that it's not about believing that the, these characters are real. It's about suspension of disbelief. It's about, I know Superman's not real, but if I watch the right movie, I don't care. I feel it anyway. I don't care. It. And I think chat GBT has definitely hit that for me. If Turing type aside, yeah. I think it's people use it and they don't care that it's a computer. 
They don't care. He, they're not fooled. They don't think they're the little person by the side. They don't care. It's it almost creates a, an emotional interaction for the end user. It, it, there's such a wow and aha moment that you feel it. And it gets it, it gets pronouns right. It gets grammar right. It does something that we've never actually seen before with NLU. The historical <laughs> versions of this were horrible. Do we think that this is a false start, though? I know, to me, this is a huge novelty, and I've used it a ton. Are we five years away from this to actual have some real use cases, 10 years? And I'm obviously, you've seen a lot like when Google got started, there were 16 different search engines before or whatever the story is, and a lot of other, and also before the iPhone, there was other iterations, but the technology just wasn't there yet. Do we think that this is just like a hype cycle that, is very novel and will go away? Or do we think that this is actually like the technology is going to produce real use cases that people can actually use today and pay for in some way? I'm personally very bullish on the whole area. Not just from, I think you're right, Kevin, that there's a curiosity effect here where you, just for whatever reason they broke through. But like I said, like when my parents are like, what is this thing? And they want to know it this early, right? You talk about the iPhone and sort of thing. There's a little bit of that moment. Right where at least people are even looking and you know how hard it is to get consumers to look at anything. Sure. Yeah. But no, I think there's so many use cases. I will tell you, like when you use this thing, I did some fun stuff with my kids, but I actually was telling chat GPT to make up stories. Like I, I just took some of their funny arguments or some of the trips, but turned them into almost children's book, like stories, but they're actually personal or family stories. It's the story of how grandpa started this company or right. did they, there's always different family lore. Every family has it. I think the customer service use cases, I don't know. I feel like it's very generalizable. I think right now. We've been poking at this, by the way, these use cases for five to seven years. So I yeah, 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 yeah. IPhone. There have been a lot of automated response systems. I've even funded some startups and have tried to use automated systems to do things right. like negotiate lower bills for people on the yep. I saved a thousand dollars a year using Bill Trim just because they had automated systems that basically had figured out the right way to negotiate right, right. service AT&T to get the mm. right plan for you. And um, I look at ChatGPT and I go, I'm not worried about real use cases on the, frankly, on a number of sides. I actually worry a little bit more that, to be honest, is that I think they're going to be good. It, they're probably, you're right, Kevin, I think that what's going to happen is once this gets normalized, humans are actually pretty good. We're going to figure out the tells of an automated right. response versus a nod in little ways. But I think this is very real, but I would do the same thing. Like I'm very bullish on open AI and what they're doing as well as a number of other teams and other tech companies. I don't think this is at all though, the end state or the end product. Right. I think mm -hmm. that one of my, yeah, one of my portfolio companies copied that AI is just booming, just helping mm -hmm. marketing managers already. And the, the number of users they have is phenomenal. For your, several of your portfolio companies have made it into this podcast and discussion forum before, Open Door being one of them, yeah. Copy AI being another. I'm sure there'll be others. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I just, I just look at things and, and you know, in some and Airhouse, of, yeah, of course. Of Air course, Airhouse. Air Air well, it's I just absolutely. assume Kevin, you're going to make that work because you know, amazing, <laughs> relentless, <laughs> relentless. Um, yeah, I will. I won't stop. <laughs> yeah, you will stop. But um, but no, fundamentally, I mean, I like to have a lot of humility around consumer products, right? It is so when you make when you're a product leader, product manager, and consumer, there's a reason why we all use these kind of slugging percentage versus batting average analogies, etc. Mm -hmm. so you're a consumer product, you just know like you can have a dozen good ideas, and you're so lucky if you can even get a team to build half of them, convince them mm -hmm. to build it. And then half again, you're lucky if they actually work and move the metrics. And if one or two of those actually break through on phenomenal, like you're really good. Like you're just really mm -hmm. good. And um, it's just such a high error rate. And when I, when you see things starting to blow up or you see people adopting things that quickly, that's why I'm bullish on the whole era. I'm just like, this is, mm -hmm. this is not a normal consumerish kind of launch, et cetera. There's some. I actually like your Uncanny Valley analogy. Some line's been crossed here, some tipping points. But yeah, I, I think we're going to see this just rolled. I think we're going to spend the next 10 years going from early adopter care categories where people are risk-seeking and willing to right. try new things for advantage. But we're going to still be talking in the 2030s and 2040s about watching this roll through products and services and changing them, in my opinion. I can't tell you how much when I was at Wealthfront, one of the features I always wanted to do is just have a simple, great financial advisors will send a note to their clients every quarter. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit about what happened in the markets, how it fits into their mm -hmm. approach. And you're just highlighting the good things and just the things that they're watching, et cetera. And it doesn't scale, 
right? So advisors can do this when they have a certain number of clients, but at some point you're just writing a column and it's no longer personalized. I look at this stuff and go, wow, like that combination of personalization with communication, right. with pulling right. in relevant facts, just the relevancy of the information pulled in is actually just impressive. It's not like a search engine, but it, it feels to me like we've crossed some line around communication that really is going to make it so that I'm not saying that it's better than all humans at communicating, et cetera. Just better um, than the average. <laughs> definitely the average. Yeah. 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 I think what's so interesting is I built a number of company that relies on extractive summarization and extra, mm -hmm. it took us, I built a company called Nanit and it took us an incredible amount of engineering to get to an ESPN highlight reel of what happens to your kid. And that's one of our core value props. I didn't, I saw the beginning of generative AI and I thought it was a toy. And now we're six months later and you can see how this is going to change everything from whether it's OpenAI to Sansom to Diffusion, to Diffusion, to whatever. And there are so many other applications and with Copy AI and Jasper and those type of things, you're just grasping at the beginning of what is possible. It's almost the why now for a lot of different companies is today. And it's because of some of these unintended consequences and what you can do by just putting some of these APIs together. So I'm incredibly bullish on it. I just had to say it. I'd love to ask everybody on here because we all have different opinions on this. And I think me and Adam are going to be aligned. But we have Joe who he is building in. And also we're trying to help out founders, hopefully that are listening or employees. So Joe, he built a company in Silicon Valley. Now he's in LA. We have Julian, who is Canadian. He splits his time between the coast. We have Andy, who built his company in New York. Myself, I'm a transplant from Canada. I moved to Silicon Valley. I moved here for the, as we started out the, these conversations, like Adam, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, but like you took a meeting with me when I was first starting SHIP and like you, you were a CEO of a massive company. You just took that meeting. I was just in, infected by the generosity and like the people component of like building in Silicon Valley. So my question to everybody here, do we, so do we think that remote working is the way to do it? Do we think that Silicon Valley building in person is not as important as we build up more of these different remote tools? My, I have, I have a very hard stand after we've gotten through this pandemic, I'm going to be scaling my company out of the Bay. It's now not just the South Bay or San Francisco. I'm actually in the East Bay right now and then Orinda. So I think it's expanded there, but I love the in-person nature and just the people that are here. I'm curious just to go around the table. What I'd be love to maybe even start with Joe. Like, why did you go from Silicon Valley to LA? Now you're starting another company there and you've started your last company there too, as well. And what your thoughts on remote versus in-person are? Yeah. So my time in San Francisco was amazing in the Bay Area. Like I moved there when I started Cloud and it changed my life. It opened a million doors and yeah, it's a time well spent for sure. The, what started fading for me was I love consumer tech and I felt like I wasn't getting enough. Like I was only talking to tech people, not talking to enough people that use tech, but don't obsess about the inside baseball. So being in LA, being around different types of creatives has been really great for me and for my process, but I'm still riding the wave of people I know that I spent time with <laughs> during cloud. So if you're just breaking in, it's if you're not in San Francisco, New York, LA, like Austin, wherever, Miami, you don't get that network. Not that you can't succeed, but it is, I would imagine, harder. My team for this current company, we are like half in LA and half not. The product team, like design and product management are all together in an office basically every day. It's everybody else's thoughts. Adam, you want to you go next? Um, after Daffy is my first experience with Daffy was founded in the pandemic. So we were remote first by requirement. Although we now have a headquarters in Los Altos and people come in several times a week, some people five days, some people just a couple. That's great. I don't know. I'm more pragmatic about this. To me, this is, and this will just sound like shades of gray, but I, it's how I run, but it's like, we, we know that remote can work and open source has worked. WordPress is amazing. What Matt Mullenweg has been able to do is amazing. We can all point to examples. So it was always possible. 
Uh, but we also knew it wasn't the dominant case. It was like a one in a hundred. I think that that one in a hundred may have shifted to five in a hundred or 10 in a hundred. I don't know, maybe even more. I totally agree um, with you. But uh, I think it's a mistake. Listen, I'll just go from the financial side, financial planners and that sort of thing. Retirement's a hard problem because people replacing what they got from work turns out to be not just about money. It's like, there's so many aspects to your social life, your identity and all these other things. And I probably am more, I don't want to say skeptical, but I don't think we've thought through exactly how remote work affects people over time. There's some people built to do it, but yes. there's a lot of, of energy. Like for me, the energy I get in an in-person brainstorm or sitting and talking to a person over their computer, it's just, there's no substitute for it. And I think we're seeing a lot, a, a bigger set of models. I love that actually people can start companies in more places now. And mm. the biggest thing is the willingness of investors to engage with founders who are not in their backyard just opens up things much more. But that being said, like, I, once again, not to be, and I may just be biased, a creature of my era, that sort of thing. But I was talking about it, like, it is, it is, there's a density thing to it, right? I take my kids to school and the baseball game and it's, oh, what are you doing? Oh, I just went to a new startup. What does it do, et cetera? I used to joke about this, but right. when it's the bubble thing. burst in 2000, 2001, almost every nascent tech hub folded mostly. Like they just, the startup community is just almost decimated. By the way, the reason New York's a big deal now is partially because Boston almost gave up the ghost and left right. an opening for New York to take over, in my opinion. <laughs> but in Silicon Valley, we kept having startups. Why? Because we have nothing else to do. Our eggs are in one basket. Like we have enough, we have nothing. I can't even figure out, like I, all these people now are celebrating. They're excited about the World Cup. They're the you know, 49ers, people going to Warriors games or whatever. I'm like, but that feels like something else to do. We have nothing else to do. And in Silicon Valley, it's like we, we build tech, we build companies. And so it, it's almost the sport, the local sport. But yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so I don't know, uh, like to me, like I love New York. My whole family is from New York. It's I mean, LA, I have a lot of family down in LA. I have a branch of my family or stereotypical Jewish comedy writers and Hollywood creatives and that sort of thing. And so there's all sorts of wonderful aspects, I think, to building technology close to customers and close to talent that has the right influence. But uh, I don't know. I still think like right now, Silicon Valley, it's just the raw density of people who actually find technology interesting. I don't know, Joe, maybe in a funny way, it's, it's the counterpoint or it's the other side of the coin of it's wonderful as a consumer business to be around a lot of people who are normal and don't care about tech so much. Yeah. There's an amazing energy to be in a place where I could walk literally into a random coffee shop and probably strike up a conversation about what isn't interesting about chat GPT. I love that. And that's, and I'm not just rushed out as someone who weirdly cares about technology in this way. So I don't know how those things balance out, but I do think it leads to a broader set of possibilities for founders. Julian, what do you think the Canadian on the crew. I'm still Canadian, but I don't, I know all no, you're live not. There. No, you're gone. Well, I'm dual Get citizen. Out of here. He is very the, nice. I just want to say, I will say the energy of Silicon Valley is real. For those of you, the, anyone listening who's, oh, but is it worth it? Should I go somewhere? You probably should go somewhere. And you should probably go to Silicon Valley, especially at the beginning of your career. If you are a particular type of company, you can make it work remote. The, I'll be even more specific, the smaller the user size and the more number of users you need, probably the more remote it can become. If you're an enterprise sales company, you should be in Silicon Valley probably, right? Like it, to me, it correlates in that way. And, and I will say one more thing about it, which is that I ran my last company in an office, a set of offices. We sold offices through technology, all these other things at, at practice will remote. The reason I feel that it is doable is because you have to feel high ownership on the, from the screen on the other side of the screen. If hmm. you don't feel high ownership, you're like, probably they don't happen. That's my assumption. And that's why I feel that I've been able to get there because the people around me are high ownership and I can feel it through the screen. Otherwise I would default maybe even to Kevin, how you feel and Adam, how you feel about it. There's something about energy coming in into a room. There is something about that there getting is. that energy that we try to drive that. Andy, last thought on this. So I started my career working on a street called Middlefield. I then my next job was on a street called University Avenue. I, I, my network is Silicon Valley. I happen to live in New York, but I go back once a month. My executive team from Val is based in Silicon Valley. The one lives in San Carlos, the other is in the Mission. And 
I've only run distributed. My last company, I started it with a bunch of Israelis. And Israelis have very interesting distributed work experience because every mm -hmm. company starts in Israel, builds a product, and then when they go, then the market is not Israel. So they have to immediately set up a presence in New okay. York. So now we were heavily distributed. Val was heavily distributed. Both of these companies, I could have built them in Silicon Valley, but to do them in New York and not be distributed is actually impossible. The talent I needed wasn't there. The institutional knowledge I needed wasn't there. So I live in New York, but I view my advantage in life as Silicon Valley. So I'm going to leave it as that. But I will run distributed in the future. I will have hubs and offices in the future. Go back and forth on this. But the only model I've ever been successful with is distributed. Well, I think let's end it there. Adam wanted to thank you so much for taking the time. And most importantly, for joining the founder side of the equation. You've done so much in your career. And we're so happy to welcome you with Baffy. No, and I'm happy to. And I wouldn't be a good founder if I didn't give the last plug to say, if you are the, <laughs> one of those 60 to 70 million people, households in the U.S., who gives to charity every year, whether it's a school, uh, religious institution, et cetera, or you're just the type of person who likes to give a bit of what you make every year, definitely check Daffy out, daffy.org. Easy to start up, easy to sign up. We're really trying to build something new and special here, aligning around how just making it easier for people to give. Just make it as easy as people saving for retirement or saving for their kids' college, make it easy to put money aside for charity. But I do love being here and I love telling stories and I, I love thinking about where the industry is going. So I appreciate you guys having me on the podcast for sure. Uh, it was a blast. Hey, yeah, we keep it real and we bring you the facts. It's the second time founders podcast. Talking tech news, the show is a must. Not some billionaire trying to sell you their book. We're coming from a real place. Plenty ups and downs, got some insights. Join the discussion now. We being honest and raw, giving you real talk. We've been at the bottom and made it happen and much more. The second time founders podcast. More building, less talk.